While in many cases, car interiors over the years have been tasteful, there are a number of vehicles produced that had, let's call them over-the-top interiors. It could be acres of velour, it could be a color scheme, it could be a particular fabric or material, or just the overall interior theme. But in a number of cases, American automotive producers put some strange and, well, interesting interiors in their vehicles, particularly in the 1970s. And perhaps that's because the 70s really was the decade of excess. In terms of the overall cars, the cars were large and in charge, and you had to have an interior that suited the vehicle. So let's get started with this list of top 10 crazy interiors of all time. At number 10, we have the 1978 Mercury interior that could be found in the Marquis as well as the Colony Park. Now, 1978 was a special year at Ford Motor Company and the Mercury division because this was the last year that its full-size vehicles were truly full-size before becoming downsized. General Motors had already downsized their vehicles, including the wagons, for the 1977 model year, but it took Ford until 1979 to effect a similar downsizing. Now, in 1978, both the Colony Park as well as the Marquee had some awesome interior options, but my favorite of all time, and I think the most over-the-top, is the two-tone green interior that was offered in both vehicles, which had some differences between them. Now, while the Colony Park didn't have a two-tone paint scheme because it had these wood grain sides with yacht deck paneling, the Marquis could indeed have two-tone exterior, but both did have a two-tone interior. Let's take a look at the Colony Park first. And here you have it. Check out that beautiful two-tone green interior. This just contrasts and complements beautifully the jade green paint on the exterior of the vehicle. But can you imagine sitting in this? Look at that carpet as well as those vinyl seats. Now, you could also get a similar two-tone green interior on the Fords with the Landau Luxury Group. But I just think the Marquis and the Mercury's are a little bit more luxurious. And they cost a little bit more, so that's why they made this list. And here you have a shot of the dashboard and the interior. You can again see the two-tone green seats, but check out the door panels. They were also two-tone with this really cool pleated design and fake wood grain. The dash by this point of the Fords had become pretty conventional and was used across Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury with just a few subtle differences. They all had that supersized glove box there on the right. But in general, I just think that this two-tone green interior, well, over the top is also quite cool. And I have to say that if you're going to pick up a 1978 Mercury, well, you're going to pick up a really great riding vehicle. I do think the 71s to 74s of this generation, or even the 69s and 70s, ride a little bit better and have more sound deadening than the 1978s as Ford was starting to implement cost cuts during that time frame. But these are still pretty awesome vehicles. And here's a shot of the interior of the two-tone marquee, or the grand marquee interior in this case. And you can see, again, that two-tone green is just all over the place. A little bit different seats, but still very similar to the Colony Park. And that's why this one makes the list at number 10. Now, at number 9, we have another Ford. And I must admit the Fords here are lower on the list because they generally had tasteful interiors. But this is another over-the-top interior, and that is the 1971 Ford Thunderbird, the Brome interiors, both in the coupe as well as the four-door sedan. And yes, notice I did point out the four-door Thunderbird. This was during the time period where, as you can see here, Ford was producing a four-door Thunderbird for a brief bit until the 1972 model year when it was redesigned. And you can see the rear door, it's a suicide door with the portion of the door cut kind of being hidden by that Landau bar on the C-pillar. Ooh, just awful. But in any case, the Thunderbird was still a cool car. And in sport coupe form, I think it actually was quite handsome. Of course, it did still have that Nudesden nose up front or the bird beak. Now, for 1971, there were two really cool interior packages that were both part of the Brome option, but they were different between the coupe as well as the four-door sedan. The first is this hopsack interior that was the Brome interior on the two-door coupe. Now, take a look at it here. It had kind of an interesting, like, knapsacky feel to it. And I have no idea why Ford thought that this was something that belonged in the Thunderbird, which really was a luxury car back then, but this was the optional interior. And so you basically got a potato sack stitched into your seats if you got the Brome interior. Now, overall, the 71 Ford Thunderbird interior was actually still quite handsome. This is basically the Mark III in a number of forms, just 
revised a little bit. And you can see that in the climate control panel as well as the pods there for the various gauges, very similar to the Mark III interior. And the interior overall is pretty tasteful. The door panels look tasteful and the seats, I think the high back seats look tasteful. It's just this fabric that's rather strange. By the way, this clearly has the optional cruise control. You can see those buttons on the steering wheel there. But the more over the top Rome interior for 71 came in the four door sedans. Take a look at this interior here where you could transform your Thunderbird into a bordello. That is a high amount of button tufting all over the seats, the backs, as well as the bottoms. And as you'll see in a minute, that continued front and rear. And these door panels are far more complicated in terms of their design than they were on the coupe with that hopsack cloth interior. And here's the same interior, but in black. And I guess this makes it look a bit more muted, but you can see the complexity of the door panel there with all of the ribbing. Again, not something that you saw in the coupe door panel. I suppose it's elegant, but it certainly is over the top. And the dashboard is obviously the same between the coupe and the sedan. Let's take a look at the rear seating area now. And here you are, you can see that that button tufting continues in the rear. And I think it even looks more outlandish in the rear just because it's a more compact space. Now, interestingly, this car does have black seat belts, but I don't believe that these are the deluxe seat belts. The non-deluxe seat belts just happen to be black, irrespective of the interior color. But the buckles were different on the deluxe seat belts. So somebody got this brome interior, but didn't want to pay for the deluxe buckles, probably because you got black seat belts with your black interior, didn't feel like it was warranted. And here's one more of this interior in brown, looking at the instrument cluster. This does have the rim blow steering wheel, where you pinch the rim in order to honk the horn. I do think that, like I said, the IP looks tasteful. It's not as glamorous as the IPs back from, let's say, the 1967 Thunderbird, but overall still looks good. And I will say these Thunderbirds ride and drive extremely well, but their interiors are certainly over the top. Next at number eight, we'll head over to the Mopar area and talk about the 1972 Imperial interior, particularly the optional leather interior the 1972 and 73 Imperials, and only in the four doors. By 1972, the Imperial was almost hitting the end of the run as its own make. That would stop in 1975 before it was revived in 1981 to 1983, and then subsequently sunset yet again. Now, by 1972, these fuselage era Imperials, when they were introduced in the 1969 model year, shared a lot more in common with their lower Chrysler brethren than the Imperials previously did, let's say in the mid-60s when they still had a full frame and rode atop a different chassis from the Chryslers. But again, by this point, the Imperials were really becoming more, let's say, glamorized Chryslers. And that began for the 1967 model year when Imperial went to a unitized chassis and then continued even more in this fuselage era. But the Imperial was still large and in charge and just a cool vehicle. And the 1973 Imperial was actually the longest factory-produced non-limousine vehicle ever sold in the United States. And it measured 235 inches in length. The 1972 Imperial is effectively the same car. It just doesn't have the extended bumper guards on the front or rear that added several inches to the vehicle. But these cars are absolutely enormous. And they're unibody, as I mentioned, as well. Now, aside from the exterior being super cool and I think excellently styled, take a look at the interior here. And again, this was only offered in the four doors, but you have this particular Imperial finished in gold leather interior. And wow, is this over the top. Look at those overstuffed seats that really were patterned after the Barcelona chair. And you even have a number of excess items spilling over into the door panels like the little map pockets there, you can see a pouch that you lift up a flap on the door panel and that exposes a storage compartment underneath it. That was something that Ford would later copy. And here you could see a bit of the rear seat detail. Notice that head pillow as well as the lavalier strap and a little reading light back there. This is the only vehicle, Chrysler's are the only ones that I know of, at least for the domestics that had that head pillow there. And it's actually pretty effective and nice. It's not overly soft, but it's got a lot of padding in it, and that rear seat has a ton of room. you also notice that the rear window is Frenched in. There was a cap placed 
over the Chrysler windows to give these Imperials a more exclusive look from the outside. And I think it worked. It gave these Imperials a very tasteful look. Now let's take a look at the instrument panel because this is kind of where this Imperial gets let down. And unfortunately, the over-the-top nature of the rest of the interior didn't necessarily carry over to the instrument panel that was shared with Chrysler. And here it is. As I mentioned, Chrysler had the same instrument panel, at least the same speedometer and gauge cluster, although the Imperial did have more gauges. You got a temperature gauge as well as a volt gauge and oil pressure. And the Chrysler's, you really just got an alternator gauge and the fuel gauge. So you did get more gauges here in the Imperial, and you did get more padding on the instrument panel, but the radio as well as the climate control and the speedometer were the same. This does have Chrysler's AutoTemp 2 setup, which was also sold to Mercedes, and it's controlled by a box under the hood. It's a pretty simple system, although they tend to fail at this age. The housings were made of plastic originally, and the rebuilt ones, which cost about $600 now, are made out of metal. There is a fair amount of coolant that flows through that setup under hood, so you can imagine plastic combined with engine coolant, eh, not a great idea. It's kind of like having water-cooled alternators, which some cars did have at some points in time. In any case, this interior, I hope you would agree, is over-the-top but tasteful in a way, and that's why it's only number eight on this list, because it actually is rather tasteful. And now we switch over to the General Motors side of the house in the 1977 Pontiac Bonneville Brome. Now you're going to see a fair amount of General Motors vehicles from here on out because they had a lot of over-the-top interiors. But we'll start with this Bonneville. In 1977, as I previously mentioned, General Motors downsized all of its full-size cars, and that obviously included the Bonneville as well as the Caprice from Chevrolet, the Olds 98 and 88, as well as the Buick Electra and LeSabre. And of course, there was the Catalina for Pontiac at the lower end and the Impala at the lower end for Chevrolet. But the coolest over-the-top interior came in this 1977 Bonneville Brome. And here you see it, the 1977 Bonneville Brome with the optional Valencia cloth interior. Take a look at those zebra stripes on the seats as well as notice that it's also on the door panels. This is, I think, one of the most over-the-top interiors that Pontiac ever produced. It's pretty gosh darn crazy, but I guess you could sit back in your 1977 Bonneville Brome and enjoy the ride in sybaritic comfort. The Bonneville would remain about this size on its 116-inch wheelbase and about 215 inches in overall length until the 1981 model year, and in 1982, it would switch to the downsized G platform before returning to be, well, we'll call it full size in 1987, where it was part of the H body platform. In any case, this Valencia interior came in two different colors, the beige-ish black that you see here, as well as a red color. Take a look. Gosh, that is just awful. I don't know what to say about it, but it looks even worse in the coupe. I guess if you're trapped in the back seat, I wonder how you'd feel, almost like you want to throw up in your mouth looking at this interior. At least the Bonneville Brome did have a handsome instrument panel. You can see this inverted racetrack theme on the IP with the warning lights in this top band that's black, kind of similar to Lincoln interiors beginning in 1970. In any case, this Bonneville Brome interior is just absolutely nuts. I think in red, it's the worst. I don't know who would order it, and maybe that's why it didn't last very long as an interior option, but it certainly makes the list, and here it is. Let's move on now to number six, and we transition to the Oldsmobile division of General Motors, and that is the 1972 Oldsmobile 98 Regency. Now, Oldsmobile had redone its full-size cars for the 1971 model year, as had Chevrolet, Pontiac, Buick, and Cadillac. But for 1972, Oldsmobile division's general manager, John Belts, wanted something more special than the regular Olds 98 or even the Olds 98 LS trim, which was the highest trim of the 98. And so John Belts asked interior designer Blaine Jenkins what he could do with $100 extra dollars on the interior, to which Blaine replied, well, almost anything. And the design team came up with, for the time, a relatively novel, loose cushion style design for the seats. Now, there were others that had this design. I just mentioned the 72 Imperial had this loose cushion design, but Olds took it, I would say, to a whole new level because the loose cushion look on the seat back went all the way up as opposed to partially up on the Imperial. Now, in addition to crazy amounts of button tufting on the seats, which you can see here, you also got that button tufting and padding 
on the door panels. And you got a Tiffany clock, which was not designed by Tiffany, but Olds paid some royalties to Tiffany, at least in the first year. The Tiffany clock would change in subsequent years. And the rest of the instrument panel was kind of standard 98 fanfare, which you can see here has that driver-centric theme. But it was just an interesting package that proved so successful that Olds made the 98 Regency not just a one-time event, but made it an option on 98s for a number of years to come. And here's a better picture of the seats. Now, notice that super loose cushion design on the seat back. It's not actually loose. It is stitched into the seat. You can't remove it. But it does have a cool look to it. It's not as comfortable as you would think. The padding's relatively firm in these, and perhaps some of that is just the degradation due to age. But it would be nice if they were a little bit softer. And in fact, as the years went by, that is actually what happened to the padding. But this first year, I think they were really just going after looks. And nonetheless, the 98 was a great vehicle to have. You get all sorts of options. And here, this, you notice above the climate control on the driver's side there, there's three toggle switches. Well, this car not only has rear window defroster as well as cruise control, but also the night watch setup which allowed you to delay the headlamps from turning off as well as automatically turn them on when it was dark outside. So you could get great options in your old 98. Of course, you got the Rocket 455 engine underhood to power you. So because of this crazy interior that's over the top, the old 98 makes this list. Now for number five, we go back to Mopar and the 1977 Chrysler Newport with the Williamsburg cloth interior. Ooh. Take a look at this interior pattern on the seats as well as the door panels. As I said, this was available in 1977 Chrysler Newport. So not available in the New Yorkers, the New Yorker Bromes, which would have been the top of line vehicles. And the New Yorker Brome would have had the button tufted, loose cushion style seats, similar to actually the old 98 Regency. But the lower end Newport came with this Williamsburg cloth that is just horrendous. And I don't know, again, what were the designers thinking when they come up with this? Now, of course, they named it Williamsburg cloth. I have no idea why and what tie it has to the Virginia colony that existed until 1780. But it certainly is a overall hideous interior. And you could get it in multiple colors, not just the black, but Take a look here at this gold Williamsburg cloth interior. Ooh, that gold. At least you got a cool center glove box, that big glove box there. Similar to the center glove box you would get in the early 70s General Motors vehicles if you got the airbag wheel. You couldn't have the glove box on the passenger side because the airbag deployed out on that side. So you got a center mounted glove box on those vehicles. But what's amazing about this Newport is that this Williamsburg cloth interior is part of an interior on a car that otherwise is kind of plain looking on the outside. I don't think anybody would see a 1977 Newport and say, huh, boy, that's a radical looking car. Maybe you could say that for the New Yorker Brome, but the Newport was just kind of average looking. But underneath its skin lies this crazy Williamsburg cloth interior. Let's move on to number four. And now we go over to our friends at American Motors Corporation to talk about the 1977 to 78 AMC Matador Barcelona. And yes, that's how you pronounce Barcelona. If you're in Spain, it's Barcelona. So we'll talk about that now. 1978 would represent the last year that AMC would sell its Matador, both in coupe and sedan form. And unfortunately, while the sedan was relatively successful over its lifetime, the coupe just never caught on because, well, it's kind of a funky looking design, as you can see here. But for 1977, on the coupes, AMC introduced a Barcelona trim that continued on into 1978. And in 1978, the trim package proved decently popular, so AMC expanded it to the four-door sedan. Now, this Barcelona package was available in two colors, that kind of goldish tone that you saw before and this two-tone red. And the interiors matched, so you could get two different colors, whether you got the coupe or the sedan. Let's take a look now at the red interior. Ooh, and look at that luxury. Well, I guess you can call it that. These Matador Barcelona interiors had this kind of loose, rumpled, velour textured fabric to them. And they do look rich, I suppose. And notice the door panel also has that similar fabric to them, although the rest of the interior is pretty conventional. These seats are actually quite comfortable in AMCs. And AMC, I think, did a pretty nice job overall with the seating, given that this is a company that just had absolutely no money. 
Remember, as I said, by this point, the Matador Coupe really had proven a flop in the marketplace, and that was costing AMC precious profitability. And by 1978, Pacer sales were already starting to slow down. So the company was really in a world of hurt, especially because it had paid a princely sum for Jeep and taken on a high level of debt not that long before. Here's another shot of the interior. You can see the IP in these Matador Barcelonas is pretty typical, although you did get the sports three-spoke steering wheel. Ooh. But overall, the Matadors were a you know decent car for what they were. AMC, again, just didn't have much money to fund new products during this point in time, or almost ever. But that 1970 purchase of Jeep really hurt them financially and made them pretty cash-strapped all the way through until when Renault had to start injecting capital by buying a minority stake in them and eventually ended up taking them over. Now, if that red didn't suit you, you could get this tan interior, which is more muted, but I think if I were going to get the Barcelona, you had to get the red car overall. I mean, the tan is eh, a little tame, but still cool. This car has the standard AMC two-spoker wheel at the time. But the Matador was a pretty cool vehicle, as I mentioned. It did make an appearance in the James Bond film, The Man with the Golden Gun. And there were a couple of designer interiors. There wasn't just the Barcelona. There was also the Oleg Cassini interior from a few years earlier. That one is my personal favorite. And I'd love to find an Oleg Cassini Matador, at least in black, with the copper trim. Although I think I'm going to be searching for a while. Moving on to number three, we're back with General Motors and the 1975-76 to 76 Buick Electra Park Avenue. Now, the Park Avenue name obviously continued on for a number of years after this, and the Park Avenue interiors for a number of years were also just as outrageous. But the 75 Park Avenue was really what started it all. This is where the Park Avenue name was born for Buick. And when you got the Park Avenue trim on your Electra, you got this awesome interior. Take a look at that velour and how it is everywhere on the seats, the upper portion of the seats, the headrests, the bottoms, the center console, this huge center console, by the way, that divided the driver from the passenger seat. There was no middle seat, obviously, here. This was just a five-passenger car. And that spilled over onto the door panels and into the rear. There's so much velour, I would say, that it's probably akin to the amount of fabric used by the artist Christo to wrap the Pont Neuf Bridge in Paris in the 1980s. It's just absolutely over the top. And here's a close-up of that center console. You can see that there's a latch there that would open it. And that little trim piece uh, on the top of the center console just says Park Avenue on it. But I love that the center console isn't just plastic or metal or something like that. It's actually wrapped in the velour fabric. And notice the super plush carpet because, of course, you can't have only plush seats. You need plush carpet as well in your Electra Park Avenue. And pulling back a bit, you can see the seats as well as the center console here in the Park Avenue. Now, with the Park Avenue, you did get all the creature comforts as per usual. And you can see the instrument panel there is pretty typical, really just idiot lights, no gauges, except you got a vacuum gauge, which is what that green, yellow, red is to the right of the 100 mile per hour marker. Because I guess people didn't realize that the harder that you step in the accelerator, the more fuel that you consume. And they needed a gauge to tell them that for whatever reason. But this 75 and 76 Park Avenue really is one of the most over-the-top General Motors interiors that I've ever seen. Although it's going to be beat out by number two and number one, both of which are from General Motors and both of which are from Cadillac. Now we move on to number two, and that is the 1975 Cadillac Fleetwood Brome with the Monticello Velour interior. Now, I know what you were thinking you, when I said 1975 Cadillac. You were thinking of a different Fleetwood, but we're going to start out with the standard Fleetwood cloth interior, and that is this Monticello Velour here in the so-called rosewood color. Now, this is just abhorrent in terms of an interior fabric. I have no idea what the designers were thinking. And I can't imagine anybody would want this in their vehicle. It looks so absolutely awful and tacky. But here you see it. I guess the only saving grace is that you got six-passenger seating in this Fleetwood Brome. And it didn't spill into the door panels. Notice the door panel there is the conventional Fleetwood Brome door panel. It does have the reading light at the front of it, which the DeVilles didn't have. And it does have lit bottoms or puddle lights, which the Calais didn't have. But this Monticello Velour is unquestionably over the top and extremely tacky. 
And as we take a look at the instrument panel, you can see that this Fleetwood Brougham just had the standard Cadillac instrument panel of the era, which was redesigned for the 1974 model year. In this kind of two-tiered theme design, the warning lights were above the speedometer, and then in the lower tier, you had the speedometer as well as all the vents. It was a theme that would last through till 1976. And you can see here, this one also has the red rosewood Monticello Velour. Let's take a look at a different color, kind of a tannish color here for this Monticello Velour. Just equally awful and abhorrent. But I guess if you're buying luxury, maybe some buyers wanted this interior because they selected it, although some of them opted for the interior that's going to make it as our number one over-the-top interior coming up now. And here we are at number one. And number one is the 1974 Cadillac Fleetwood Talisman interior. Now, as I said that, I bet somebody's there waiting to punch the keys, saying, well, the Cadillac Fleetwood Talisman was offered from 1974 to 1976. Why would you just say 1974? Well, there is a distinct reason for that, and that is because in 1974 and 1974 only, the Talisman was a four-place, four-passenger car. That's it. It had this huge center console in the front, as you're going to see. It had a similarly huge one in the rear, so you could only see four people in a car with 133-inch wheelbase, which is just absolutely nuts. In 1975, they would eliminate the chunky rear center console so you could at least seat five people in the vehicle. And here we have the rear of the Fleetwood Talisman. Notice, as I said, it has a similarly large center console, so you can only seat four. And that pillow that you see in this picture, yes, that is part of the Fleetwood Talisman interior. You got a pillow. I think you actually got two pillows and a so-called lap robe. Now, the lap robe is missing in this photo, but oh well. The Fleetwood did have footrests and crazy furry carpet. Look at the fabric on the door panels as well. It's not shown in the photo, but I can tell you that the velour even wrapped the B pillar on these vehicles and the C pillar. So it was just over the top, everywhere, ubiquitous velour. Now, I'm not quite sure what you were supposed to store in these oversized consoles. Here you can see the front console had two different compartments. The front portion had a light, and then you could put a notepad in there. And then the back was just pure storage, but there's two separate latches, which you can see there in the middle divider of the center console. Regardless, the Fleetwood Talisman, and in particular the 74 Fleetwood Talisman, to my mind, is just the absolute most over-the-top interior ever put in a vehicle. And of course, it went in a Cadillac. And there you have it, the top 10 list of most over-the-top interiors. Did I forget one? Put it in the comments section. Maybe somebody like some of the other AMC designer editions or some of the Ford Mark V designer editions. But I thought this was the list of the most outrageous that were out there. In any case, thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. And until next time, take care.